Thanks to Tonic Object, to Mike, to all of Software GR for having me tonight. Um, it is fantastic to be here. I've been having a really great time. Um, so this probably isn't a surprise. I'm going to talk about redesigning web application today. Who here works on one of those? Just show of hands. Fantastic. Um, designers? Nice. Developers? Mostly. Something else? You're something else. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, so I'm an interaction designer, and uh, that means I work on the layout and the behavior of software. I'm not really focused on making it pretty, although that can be ancillary to it. Um, I figure out the best way that software can communicate to people, what happens when you click a given link, hit a button, submit a form. Uh, and then once that's all done, I sit in the middle of everyone and annoy people with questions about functionality and typography until it gets shipped. Uh, I do all of that in order to advocate for the user or the customer so that they can have the best experience possible. Uh, obviously, people redesign their products all the time. Like Mint.com did it recently. Basecamp did it twice in the past few years. This is not that uncommon. It's not just an iteration type thing. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about why people redesign their apps because you never really want to give somebody an app that sucks, but you also never want to give someone an app that isn't worthy of a, your marketing page. Uh, your marketing page is probably awesome. Does, raise your hand, last survey question, if your marketing page does not match the quality of the software that you actually give somebody when they get in the door. They're both really terrible. They're both really terrible? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, and I spend a lot of time optimizing marketing pages so that they look great and communicate effectively. And I can tell you there is a grievous mismatch between most marketing pages and most web apps. Um, you get folks in the door, and then you greet them with a bucket of sewer water on the head, and that sucks. Uh, <laughs> it sucks for your customers because they're stuck with a subpar experience. And it sucks for you because you're perceived as dishonest. Um, when you drop someone from your amazing conversion funnel into a carnival of Helvetica Noia and 1.0M letting, you are giving them a clickable tax form, and you are probably doubling your churn rate. So let's not do that, right? Um, so where are all the areas that we're going to be focusing most of our attention to keep that from happening? Uh, I have an informa information architecture background, so of course I'm going to go hard on navigation. Uh, it is how most of the biggest tasks get completed in web applications. It is also how you wayfind and orient yourself. It needs to be clearly worded, legible, and as fast as humanly possible. So these are two different bookkeeping applications, for example. Uh, these are QuickBooks and Bench. And they have, this is just the navigation from them. They're both a left sidebar. But after you use the product enough, um, you find out that Bench has way clearer labels, and it's a lot easier to figure out. And when you click on something, it's so much faster and doesn't have to refresh the page. So the process of navigating is speedier and more efficient. Uh, next up is the dashboard, which the first screen that you see after you log in. Um, what is it? What does it communicate to you? If you are just starting with the application, a dashboard needs to convey the application's utility and hopeful outcomes. If you're a veteran to the application, it should convey the application's overall status as well as what to do next. Um, and those can often be mutually exclusive things, and it's very hard to get them both right in a way that onboards people effectively and keeps teaching people about continued use of the application. Um, your settings matter, too. Like we've, I think we've all been in the sort of conversation where you and another team member are discussing the product's direction, and you come to a disagreement about some design detail that needs to happen. And instead of compromising uh, on two different perspectives about how the application should work, you settle to, let's default on one and just add a switch in the settings, and then you can change it there, and we'll give people the option to do that so that it can be maybe piecemeal, iterative, something like that. And that's how you end up with a setting screen that looks like this, right? Um, don't do that. Note, note on the right, this is kind of getting cropped here, but there's a scroll bar. Uh, and there, are, and there are seven tabs up top there, so uh, That's real. this is real. This is for an ATM. Uh, yeah, somebody found it stuck on the settings screen when they went to get money out and took a photo. And then the software's designer was like, oh, thank you so much for appreciating my application. Here's the full screenshot. Uh, yeah, this, this happened like, and, and lest you think, oh, it's Windows 95, this is horrible, lol, six weeks ago. So there are some of the biggest elements where some things can go wrong. Um, and some of the consequences, uh, inefficiencies. Uh, when it takes too long to complete a task, you are dealing with inefficiencies. And that can involve too many steps. You have to click a lot. 
It can involve too much time. It takes too long to load, like on QuickBooks. Um, the former is an interaction design issue and is usually in my purview to fix. Uh, the latter is usually a development or an ops issue, uh, making the application faster. Um, it's still a user experience issue, though, and I end up fighting for that quite a bit. Inconsistencies. Uh, if there are two different ways to do the same thing, you have two different controls, two different paths, you're probably dealing with an inconsistency. Um, if you have two different data tables that look vastly different, maybe you should find some way to square up their styles so that it's not so inconsistent. Um, consistency brings clarity to interfaces, makes it easier for them to be used. Uh, just looked at all the different ways that you can enter transactions in QuickBooks. Who, who here uses QuickBooks online and is like, yeah, you're probably like PTSD about this right now, I'm very sorry. Um, or like the different treatments of preferences in Basecamp. There are like 18 different types of checkboxes in Basecamps 1 and 2, and clicking them has different behaviors. Um, and both of those products, I know Basecamp just redesigned, I haven't looked at it, but in the past, Basecamp and QuickBooks both kind of lost their way over the years. Um, next, there's complexity. Like, people love making their web applications as complex as possible, right? I'm just going to leave that there for a minute. Because <laughs> um, they view features as a gift. It's like, we give you a new way to do something. But that's another thing for novices to learn. It's another thing to worry about when you're coming in and doing uh, anything in the application. Um, desktop layouts become heavily favored as a result because they're more room to fit features. Uh, and as a result, you generally get small tap targets, really data dense interaction models, and a very hard road ahead if you want to make anything mobile friendly. Which brings me to my last bit here. Um, you think it was table stakes to make your web app responsive in 2015, and uh, sadly, no. Um, most web apps don't bother, or they just use the default Twitter bootstrap theme that happens to be responsive, and then when it shrinks down to being responsive, it looks like a giant disaster, which we'll be seeing in about 20 minutes. Um, and uh, sometimes they build an iOS app and they use a web view to do it so that it's actually just a web page crammed in there and it's the responsive. I had one site that gave me a 404 page for a Fortune 100 company when they tried to redirect me to an MDOT site that didn't even exist anymore. And I'm just looking at this like I loaded this on my iPhone, right? So with all that in mind, is that a long list? Not really. Many of the concepts are interrelated. Um, do they have significant ramifications for how people use your app? I mean, who wouldn't want a clearer interface that made people more efficient? I hope that's why you all came out here tonight, right? So how do you get it done? Uh, that is a very good question. I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes talking about that. Um, I'm just going to do the elephant in the room part really quickly before we go into like actual design details. Uh, and that is how you encourage all of this to happen within a messy political organization. Uh, design is a pretty picture until it's shipped. It is speculative until you put it in front of customers. I can design this wonderful comp, and it doesn't actually matter until it gets shipped. Uh, so I'm going to talk about workplace politics for a little bit. Um, because you probably already have a design process in place. Many people do. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you to overhaul it, other than to perhaps hire an interaction designer, add some UX to the beginning of your process, and provide some follow through. Um, but more importantly, having a good design process isn't as important as ensuring that you have the right political environment to ensure that good design can succeed. Um, you can have a great process, but that's talk, right? So what does the ideal state look like? Uh, in my admittedly meager years of experience doing this for a living, here are a few traits that I've found that um, are more or less very important. Um, Approval from the top. You are mucking in significant ways with the biggest product in the business. That almost certainly requires con enthusiastic and continuous CEO approval. So you need to work on that by convincing her that this is the way forward for the business. Um, and you need to keep that maintained over the course of the project. Um, the ability to recognize big issues. Uh, I've been in so many situations where I tried to move something 10 pixels and it required six months of development time. Um, I have a client right now that's trying to reword the label on one field uh, for their sign-up flow, and it required redoing their entire billing system. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Uh, and you're, you're probably thinking of a lot of places in your products where this sort of development time is required. Um, and, and I want to be very clear that good design touches all parts of the product. And it is easy to say, oh, we can't just, we just shouldn't do this over here. And then it kind of bleeds out to the rest of the product. 
Um, so you need to recognize these issues as early as possible before they become showstoppers. And you need to be able to evolve them as the project goes along. I mean, who here has been in a project that had scope creep issues? I mean, right, everyone, right. Um, and so these issues are going to change. You might find that something that you overestimated ended up being trivial. Um, you're more likely to encounter a lot of new problems and misestimate the amount of work that's required to solve stuff. So you need to be flexible. Um, and then the last point, I have been writing about this a lot lately, but uh, something that I found that results in a much, much more successful project for a UX standpoint is to have UX people come in and QA the product. Um, typically, QA is something that's only done by developers, and it's meant to isolate and fix bugs, right? Um, and it's nice to think that all the interaction design can be done before a project begins, but in a perfect world, you should be following up on what's being made. Um, so what does a QA uh, process look like for a designer? It means a few things. Clicking everything. Um, you need to make sure that everything has its intended behavior. If a given link needs to have a larger target, that's better to flag once you begin to get a prototype together. Um, you often find that a lot of specific details were interpreted differently by developers, like the size of tap targets, uh, the destination of certain links, that sort of thing. Perform every task. Everything that the application should do for someone, do it with every possible permutation of the settings, if humanly possible. Um, making sure that all of those things are operating as intended. And finally, exploiting edge cases. Uh, if you have customers in the UK, you should probably know how their addresses work because it's really baffling and weird, um, right? If you have customers in Iceland or China, you should probably know how their names work because they are not anything like what happens in the United States. Uh, if somebody opens an 18 megabyte JPEG in a plain text editor and then copies and pastes the output into your credit card number field, what happens? <laughs> Do you know? So um, in sum, if you have like a dedicated QA staff, the best thing that you can do for yourself in this situation is to have a designer sit alongside them, learn the process, figure out Jira or Pivotal or whatever tracker you use, and try to pick apart the product. Um, anybody can pick apart a product. I'm about to do it. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's something that even novices can do. And it will almost certainly result in a better design product. And I've seen it happen so frequently. Um, no project needs every single one of these things to happen. Uh, but as mentioned, I'm trying to express an ideal state. If you have all of these, you are setting yourself up for success from the get-go. If you have none, you are handicapping yourself to an almost hilarious extent. So do what you want with all of it, but know that accepting and shipping design is not easy at all. Um, I'm going to go into one last logistics and political thing, and then we'll get into actual design stuff. Um, when is the most likely time that people do this? Um, I found it happens most frequently under these circumstances. When you hire a new designer, uh, people want to make a splash. When they just get hired, they I have found that designers just want to change as much as humanly possible to say that they put their own stamp on it. Uh, and if you're a small enough organization, hi hiring a new designer means that you've just turned over the whole design team, which means you have a whole different set of design opinions on staff. And those opinions haven't been expressed in the product yet, so you have this happen, right? They end up redesigning it then. And they want to make a big impact, and you can't blame them. Um, when you accrue too much UX debt, I'm sure most of you being developers, you've heard of the term technical debt. UX debt is real. Um, if you add too many features, if you, all of the stuff I just talked about for the past 12 minutes, uh, those are different forms of UX debt. And they result in a product that's incoherent and difficult to use. And this sort of redesign is very good for just kind of putting a reset on it and getting everything back on track. Basecamp have done this twice in the past five years. Um, and they start grandfathering people and they have a procedure for it, but it's effectively a wholly different application. So let's go back to QuickBooks and Bench for a moment. Um, they perform the same task. They manage a small business's bookkeeping. Why are they so different? I know about QuickBooks' history. I know that it used to be desktop software. I know it's for slightly larger businesses. I know it's owned by Intuit. But they could have snapped their fingers and made Bench alongside QuickBooks. Um, I also know about disruption. I know that incumbents tend to look shoddier. And to an untrained eye, Bench looks kind of threadbare and insufficient for a lot of people's needs. Um, and I don't know if that fully explains it, but it might come close, because both companies have their own internal agendas, right? Intuit's chief agenda is to protect QuickBooks. And if they released QuickBench, it would not be in their interest. 
it would bifurcate their customer base and confuse them if they ever needed to upgrade or change from one to the other. Bench's chief agenda is to provide a viable and simple alternative to QuickBooks, period. Uh, dumping a bunch of features on it would not be in their interest because it would disillusion all the people that went over to Bench because they're running screaming in the opposite direction from QuickBooks. Um, so it's unlikely that Intuit would support QuickBench at the top of the organization. It's unlikely you would get the resources necessary to build it out. And it's unlikely you'd be able to QA the product in the name of simplicity. And it's unlikely you'd be able to find a designer who would be able to totally go and redesign it because they already have an existing customer base and it would be way too radical for rework. They would be very resistant to it. Um, this is all to say, uh, if you're a UX designer into it and you want to make the next bench, you might want to quit and take a job at bench, which sounds like a huge bummer. And QuickBooks is going to stay a giant incoherent mess for the foreseeable. So that's it for the bummer. Um, but it means we can turn our attention to a redesign of an application that has a better business incentive. Uh, I'm going to whip through a light redesign of the dashboard of Cloud App. Uh, it's a cloud-based storage utility that I use every day. Uh, who here uses Cloud App, knows of Cloud App? Awesome. Um, so it's uh, basically a desktop application that captures screenshots and other files for you and uploads them automatically. You can save bookmarks to it as well. Uh, so it can act as a URL shortener, as you can possibly deduce from that. Uh, its chief competitors are Dropler and Dropbox. Uh, its desktop app is a terrific example of simplicity done right. You drag a file, the resulting link automatically copies before it's even uploaded. Um, as the file uploads, that little cloud icon there turns into a status bar, and a little check mark appears at the end. Um, you click on the icon, a list of your latest files appears. It's independently scrollable. Uh, I am not going to redesign their desktop app today because I think it's great. Uh, there are some things I change about some of the hover states and iconography. This link truncation could do a little bit better, but I, I feel those are kind of quibbles in the grand scheme of things. Their web app is a different story. Uh, I feel it has remained largely untouched since I signed up for a cloud app account in 2010. Uh, it's difficult to navigate. It doesn't really vary to meet the needs of a diverse array of uploaded content. Um, and before we pr proceed any further, I, I need to provide like a disclaimer about all of this. Uh, they are not a client, and this would go very differently if they were a client. I'm going to talk a lot at the end about how that process would differ. And redesigns, I think you could probably identify with this. They're always fraught territory, where like you get asked to like redesign Drudge Report or Craigslist or something that's horrible, or that one American Airlines rework that was like three or four years ago. And it's just somebody coming in and saying, hey, there's, this is something prettier and nicer. Um, I'm not here to make something prettier or nicer. I'm here to make it more functional and easier to use. Um, and I know that this would run into a lot of business challenges if Cloud App actually happened to be a client. So I think that making a redesign, you end up making a lot of really lazy assumptions about it. And I want to be very clear that I know I'm wading into fraught territory. The reason that we're doing this is to show the first stab at design thinking outline kind of what could potentially go wrong in an application from a usability standpoint and figure out ways to improve it. So I need to say that, especially for the internet. Um, so with that in mind, uh, here's some broad questions that I tend to ask of any design project. How do we make it easier for novices to understand what to do? Uh, once you come in for the first run experience, what do you do next? How do you learn the product? How do you become expert at it? How do we make this a place where people feel more comfortable no matter their experience level? And I know that's very squishy and qualitative, but uh, I love doing what I call the workday test. Can people depend on this product to do their jobs for eight hours straight every day? I look at products like Slack and MailChimp, and both of them are B2B and do that extremely well. Uh, so how do we make this a more welcoming and comfortable place for people to spend their time? And if you start to feel frustrated, Follow that feeling, don't blame yourself, and try and see what is tripping you up. How do we make all the functionality unambiguous? Uh, is there anything hidden? Is there anything unclear? Is there a hierarchy enforced among all the elements in an interface? Are the UI elements sensible, understandable, and up to date? Uh, I tend to do a quick audit of these sorts of things in order to ensure that everything is working up to modern standards. Uh, I love punting back to OS functionality whenever possible, so it seems familiar. Does Cloud App's overall behavior, like defaults, 
mappings, um, where you click, what it does, that sort of thing, fit one's expectations. Uh, in order to figure this out, you have to figure out what one's expectations actually are, and that might differ from team member to team member. It might differ when you, well, will differ when you put it in front of users and actually do testing with them. So it's a lot harder than you think. Um, and then I look at the product itself and start to figure out some more questions that are specific to that. How do we make Cloud App easier to browse files and links? Like that seems like one primary task because Cloud App is all about managing files and links. How do we make it more inviting to upload cloud, uh, files and links? And I, those are very similar, right? Easier and more inviting. This is when you're actually going through the task, uh, is it hard? How, how do we make it also so that people want to go through the task in the first place, right? And that seems like another goal as well. How do you make Cloud App settings more legible? I'm calling this out in specific because Cloud App settings on the website aren't so hot and they're sort of buried. There are a few critical parts that are kind of missing there. But overall, what are we doing to make the customer feel more empowered and badass by using this product? Um, there's a book called Badass by Kathy Sierra that I strongly, strongly recommend. Um, and it's, I mean, the very core of it is that a product should exist in order to benefit our customers' lives. We're not making a better product. We're making a better customer. We're making a better person because they're using the product. So how do we get people from clueless to empowered by using it? And how do we actually provide the value that's necessary for it? Um, so I'm going to go uh, through a lot of screens in Cloud App. And, and I printed out handouts uh, because I'm going to be going back to this screenshot quite frequently. And so it's just going to be a lot easier for me to do it that way. Um, so here you guys go. You can pass it back. It's seventh grade, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of screens. And um, in the interest of time, I just want to look at the dashboard. And I just want to look at this particular view of the dashboard because it has the most amount of problems. So let's go back to our big issues and our big places that we're focusing our attention and try and address each one of them. The navigation is split into two main sections. So there's the sidebar navigation here uh, where there's a list of links and it allows you to view different facets of uploads in Cloud App. And they call those drops. Uh, a header bar provides utility navigation that's right up here, and that takes you to view settings, log out, upgrade your plan. Uh, the rest of the elements either denote individual drops, such as the main content here, or provide toggles to change the way that they're displayed. So up here in, in the right, there's kind of a grid and list toggle. There's a date picker. And uh, at the top right, and I cropped this, but at the bottom, pagination exists for longer lists. So here's some of the biggest issues that I found with the navigation. And again, one man's opinion, but uh, the name on there appears to be the first half of my email address. And it's kind of cool that they've chosen Nick D here. Um, but even my mom calls me Nick D, so that's kind of great. Um, but I can easily imagine a situation where you sign up with a different email and there's no way to override it. Like, for example, uh, my partner's email address begins with Hooray Coffee. And it would be very weird to have your email just show up as Hooray Coffee in the top right corner of that application every time you loaded it. Um, upsells exist to the left of the utility pull down. Um, obviously, it's a business decision to have this, but do you really need it pushed in your face every single time that you log in, both upgrade and create a team, right? Could they appear every third or fifth time instead? Could they have just one link and rotate it? Um, I sense you'll encounter a lot of situations where the customer will never want to create a team, for example, because they aren't a business owner or a team manager, and they don't have that link in front of them every single time. What if they've already paid for Cloud App, as I have, and they just, should I be paying more? Um, you already got me as a paying customer. So the optics of that as a consumer look a little bit weird. Hovering the nav utility navigation, I don't have this on the pull down there, but if you go and like actually pull that down, it yields a third upsell, which is a refer a friend mechanism. And if you're going to keep upselling the customer, you should perhaps consider doing it in only one place. Um, I'm not against the mechanism. It's how Dropbox gained its scale by referring friends. It's how Uber's gotten a lot of its scale. Um, but I feel this could probably be better executed. Moving to the left-hand navigation reveals a few more significant issues. Um, the first one is, and, and this is going to sound weird summarized here, uh, but there's no distinction between categories and overall modes. So put another way, if you look at your navigation here, all drops, favorites, and trash, they're given equal billing with the rest of the categories, and there's no hierarchy to set them apart. 
And the rest of them are you're sorting by individual file types. So you've got this group of file types that's sandwiched in by more general functionality. And it all looks the same. Um, that looks to me to be very ambiguous on first scan. And a light rework could help enforce the distinction that these three elements really deserve. Even then, when you go into those individual categories of, of file types, it's unclear what they yield. So if I look at images, is it just ping, GIF, and JPEG? Uh, are TIFFs or BMPs or ICO files under there or weird, obscure image files that have no business opening in a browser anymore? Um, there's also text on there. Is it uh, just plain text, markdown? Uh, are PDFs in there? Are Word documents in there? And looking at this, I have no idea. Um, there is the worst word that you ever see is an information architect. Other. Uh, what does it mean? Why is it there? Um, what happens when I click other? It has, I, do I just get, do I get the PDFs? The answer is yes, you actually do get PDFs under other. And I post a lot of PDFs to cloud app. Um, there are no smart categories. Um, so you have these categories, but I hardly use cloud app for bookmarks. And it's like the, I think one of the first ones up there. Um, I use it for PDFs a lot. PDFs end up in other. Is there a way for Cloud App to maybe sniff what I'm uploading and promote some categories that fit kind of 80% of my needs? Because I don't care what your categories look like. This is a personal experience. I care about what my categories look like. Um, pagination. Um, it could probably yield some improvements. It's kind of shunted over to the side. Being right aligned kind of sucks. Um, having only one item in the bottom row, uh, which happens on most of these pages, you have uh, rows of, I believe, three items, and then there's just one hanging out at the end because they put 10 items, and when you divide it by three, you get an extra item. Um, overall, UX opinion, the number of items per page should be divisible by the number of columns that are displayed. So the page, and then the pagination should shift to match it. So if you end up you know, shrinking a browser window like you're testing responsive design and it punts back to two columns, then all of a sudden you have 10 items instead of 12 items and the pagination shifts. Um, the why? name, I'm sorry? Why does it suck to have it on the right justify? I mean, it kind of does, but why? Is there a um, convention? That's a great question. Um, my, my theory is you, it's, too far out of the way, so it's harder to scan. And when you want to actually control it, you'd end up having to move your mouse more away from the navigation. Um, and while that doesn't quite hold water on a touch-based interface, if this is the desktop application, let's assume you're using a Mac for a minute. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Americans also read left to right, so you have to look all the way to the right before you see it. That's exactly it. There's a huge usability study from like 97 or 98 by Jacob Nielsen that says that people click, like read in basically an F-shaped pattern on the page. So the top row and left column are the things that get the most amount of attention. And that's why you tend to put navigation on the left instead of the right. Um, I'd probably test either left or centered for that. Um, so uh, anyway. Uh, number 10, uh, the name next to Cloud App, uh, or Cloud App's logo in the t very top left hand corner is Drops. Uh, I thought the app was called Cloud App, and that Cloud App's chief competitor is called Droppler. And that seems really weird and awkward to me. Here's the footer, so you've got that one last item just kind of floating there, another instance of right aligned pagination. Um, the footer's navigation itself, all of these links, I think they just put it in a four column layout and ignored it for five years. Um, it simply reflects a lot of what the header is trying to do and it doesn't provide a whole lot of next steps for outreach or support. Um, the closest you get is a phone number, which is great if you're the kind of business that loves doing support over the phone. Uh, I don't know if Cloud App is one of those businesses. Um, let's move on to layout. How is the overall layout of the page? How is e easy is it to scan? How does it facilitate the product's core functions? Here's some issues with Cloud Apps layout. Drag and drop only occurs in one area. You have that green dotted line at the top of the screenshot, and you can only drag files in there. Um, but there's been kind of a UI convention over the past couple of years where you can drag files anywhere on the page, and it just shows up. Bench does this. Slack does this. Um, 
So either do that or fix the drag area to the top of the page as you scroll so it doesn't become hidden as you navigate around the rest of the listing because it's defaulting to large listings. Um, towards that and with that drop target, you can either post a file or a bookmark and you have to toggle it. So the file bookmark toggle notion is kind of awkward. You can also add a bookmark in the file dialog and it pastes it as if it's a text file. And so that seems a little bit awkward. Um, and I would allow an area where you can either add a bookmark or a file uh, and make them both visible to the customer. Having those file types on the left, um, which you kind of get from the, the footer back here, um, it makes for a lot of white space in the left-hand column, like as you scroll down. Um, and it doesn't work so well on long lists of elements, which is obviously the default for cloud app. So can we find a way to rework this so the navigation yields this extra white space and creates a little bit more rich interface? File names are truncated. Uh, everything that I have posted on this screenshot says uh, screenshot 2015-10- dot dot dot. Why? Because Cloud App automatically uploads screenshots, which is great and a feature that I absolutely want, um, and they make that a core part of the desktop app, but then you end up with a bunch of ambiguous file names here, and they only truncate on one line. Um, each of these files has a hit count. You can kind of see numbers for like 0, 15, whatever on the bottom right, and that's how many people have clicked on the file. Um, but I don't think that's immediately clear, that that's the number of hits that somebody has done on a, on a file. Uh, and it persists, so why not remove that number if it happens to number zero? Why not try and clarify what that number means in the first place? Why have it there? Is there a reasoning for it? Um, is it because you're proud of having hit count tracking? Is it because you're hoping that one of your pieces of content will go viral and get 20,000 hits? I don't know. Um, some small stuff. Select all is in all caps and no other element is on this page. That seems weird. Delete selected, uh, once you select items, you get a button that says delete selected, and it's not rounded, it's got a magenta background that stands out like a sore thumb on the, on the rest of the interface, um, and tiny little fit and finish things. So with all that in mind, uh, let's talk about behavior. You're looking at a pretty picture here, but uh, I'll try and describe behavioral issues as much as I possibly can with this, um, and figure out how we can improve it. Um, Clicking or tapping switches, you see all those switches around there? If you click the switch itself, it doesn't actually toggle it. You have to click the labels on each side of the switch in order to toggle it. Um, and that's not consistent with either typical checkbox behavior or any smartphone's interaction model. I would end up clicking one side of a switch and it would just happen to be part of that tap target and it wasn't, it wasn't really working. Um, the select all checkbox has unclear behavior. When I'm hitting select all, am I selecting all on just that page? Uh, am I selecting all items? Uh, if I'm filtered to a file type like images, am I selecting all images, all files, or just the page? Uh, it's not clear in any of those senses. Um, the date select pull down does not look like it is clearly a pull down. Uh, it is cool that you have phrased this in plain English. Uh, with the rest of the label, um, but I think you can do one better by making it more visible as a client element, uh, which is the more boring UI decision, but it was something that makes it more usable. Um, so if you look at each of these elements, there is a star and a padlock next to them. The padlock is basically de designating that link as a secure drop, which is they just give a really long URL to it, so it's unguessable. Um, that star, when you click it, you have the ability to favorite it and then keep it in your favorites in the, the side for later. So one of those icons is a function. The security of the link is a designation and they look very similar to each other and they're next to each other. Um, and I think that's kind of, it, it's a subtle thing, but if you click on the padlock, nothing happens. So is the final design responsive? Um, the dashboard has breakpoints, that's cool. Uh, I feel the drop target shrinks in size significantly, and the interface doesn't really rework itself to fit a mobile context. It's one of those where it, they probably had a breakpoint and shrunk a bunch of elements and let it be. Um, I will admit this is better than I've seen and that it's responsive at all, but Cloud App could easily go a step further in making it look like it belongs on a mobile device, especially a smartphone. Plus, you don't really need a drag target on a smartphone. 
So um, with all that in mind, I put together a redesign that tries to address pretty much everything that I just mentioned with changes big and small. And I put together a gigantic wireframe. And I'm going to pass this out. Um, and I'm going to present it to you as if you guys were a client and just kind of run down everything that I've done in order to try and improve it. Um, and uh, one other goal here to just mention is to preserve the overall layout and interaction model as much as possible so that you don't confuse existing users. So you're running against kind of two competing issues, which are that I found a bunch of problems. And if we fix absolutely everything and knock it down and start anew, then everyone who uses this or depends on it in some capacity, I don't know what their analytics look like, but you don't want to throw them off, right? So more handouts, souvenirs for home. Ah. And I posted a PDF of, oh, I posted a PDF. You can download at this link uh, in case you want to keep this as an actual document and you run a paperless office like hypocritically I do. Um, so I'll wait for everybody to get a copy. All right, are we all good? All right. So there are a bunch of things that this redesign addresses. And I did it without removing a whole lot of functionality or messing significantly with the core of the previous layout. It probably looks a little familiar. Um, and I'm going to go through all of this one by one as if you were a client and I was the hapless, barely competent designer that I am. And uh, I'll point out different bits of functionality one by one. And um, they're also elaborated on in the right sidebar. I annotate the heck out of my wireframes. And um, I write probably more than I design in most situations. Uh, whoops. Um, so you can probably see that laid bare there. So dragging files. Um, you can now drag a file anywhere on the page. It'll copy the link and add it just as if it were Cloud App's regular desktop app. Uh, the add a bookmark bar up here is always visible. Uh, upsells, there's now only one. It rotates every time that you log in. Sticky header navigation, uh, the top bar, uh, these guys encompassing like utility navigation, upsells, and the ability to add bookmarks. That's always visible as you scroll. Um, with the rest of the navigation, utility navigation and per file type navigation are split out. Um, navigation items are highlighted based on which one you're currently viewing. So all drops is bold here. Uh, and navigation occupies a single row at the top of the page. So you can kind of reclaim that left-hand column. Um, toggles, list view and sort by are collected in the same place. They were in different spots before. Um, and their behavior is made a little bit clearer. Batch select uh, is gone in favor of deleting individual items. Uh, and the reason I did that was because batch select, if you select a multiple items, the only function that you could perform on it in this interface was deleting multiple items. And they would just go into the trash anyway, so you would have the ability to undo it later. Better item display. Uh, the full file name is now visible. A padlock appears to the left of the uploaded date if it's uh, a secure upload. Um, and it's in the opposite corner of a button that toggles it as a favorite. And the hit count's been removed and is now available on individual file pages. So if you were to cl click through to that. Um, items are displayed in multiples of four. And as the layout shrinks, they can be displayed in multiples of three or two for portrait tablets or narrower browser viewports. And uh, the footer has been condensed into a single line of text and largely gets out of the way. No header links are repeated in the footer. You have the ability to go to a company blog if need be. Uh, should you still want to call Cloud App, you can do so right here. However, I'd probably advocate in favor of making that a support link uh, that takes you to a knowledge base or something like that. So what are the potential benefits of this? Um, the interface gets out of your way a little bit more. Uh, with fewer elements overall and smarter behavior, everything that's left is a little bit easier to understand and work with. The interface should be easier to scan. Uh, keeping the navigation in two rows is more likely to be readable for people for some of the reasons we already discussed. Um, and you're not hiding elements like the bookmark add form. And that's more likely to encourage their use. You've grouped some, uh, similar elements. And that's more likely to make their function clearer to the customers. So they can say, OK, well, this area is for file types. This area is for kind of overall file navigation, that sort of thing. 
Oh. Uh, the interface is clear for novices. Uh, in the absence of any files uploaded, a callout can appear to drag a file and create a link automatically. Um, and you can have that instead of that navigation. And then once somebody's dragged a file in, they're experienced with actually practicing doing that, have the file navigation appear at that point, and kind of gradually engage them with the rest of the interface. That way you can have just the very top of the header and the footer and gradually reveal elements as they become necessary to have there. Um, so obviously I'm not doing a perfect job. And I'm sure other interaction designers, other designers writ large would take a very different stab at this. Uh, so what do I think is missing right now? Um, CloudApp has a list view, totally didn't mock it up, but uh, there are a lot fewer problems with it. So I forewent it in lieu of working on the thumbnail view a little bit more. Um, smartphone and tablet layouts. I know that I just did the desktop layout after complaining about the lack of responsive design in web applications. Um, Fortunately, it is not like CloudApp has a particular lack of design inspiration for responsive rework because they have a native iPhone application that actually works really well. And I'd probably draw from that instead. Usability testing. Um, I did not have the chance to recruit users for a formal study before I did this talk. Uh, I know that should shock many of you. Um, and there are a lot of things that I did here, especially around sorting and pagination, that amount to stabs in the dark. And to repeat a previous comment, all design is speculative until you put it in front of real paying customers. I think that the upsides I listed before make sense based on my time in this industry, but I'm sure I'm just gobsmackingly wrong. It's happened before, it will happen again. Um, so you should take this with a big grain of salt and run your design past other people to see where it might fall down, and maybe even where features could be pared back even further. Um, so let's further assume that I were a consultant for Cloud App and were tasked with getting this shipped. I'll be very clear about what I think should probably happen next. Um, you as the client should critique and finalize the biggest issues. So if I'm running this by a client, they get to ask questions, critique the design, and help me revise it. Um, I just worked with a client where I had four hours of meeting time over the course of an entire week to critique seven pages. And they were the seven hardest pages of the site and we got so many of the most significant design details nailed down, but that's what I came in expecting. I did four hours on it. Um, and towards that end, I generally design the pages with the most amount of contentious decisions first. The dashboard is a terrific option for that. And that helps frame a lot of conversations better, get a critique process going, and engender trust with me and the process as I start to just knock out all the weird edge cases and other random pages that's seem like they're just kind of riffs on the same theme. Um, handling edge cases, so getting the biggest issues out of the way, pasting 18 megabyte JPEGs into a credit card form, that's my favorite. Um, checking in with developers, this is where the QA process comes in. Uh, it is important for designers to begin shepherding design through the process and communicating with developers and learning as much about development as humanly possible. Uh, I know that wades into a huge debate about whether or not designers should learn to code. Uh, however, I believe I've never, I've never really regretted learning the aspects of code that I have. Uh, and I think it's benefited me a lot. So, Once you have something together, test a prototype uh, and run it past customers. So usability testing ensures you've handled the biggest issues before you launch and you recruit a handful of participants, ask them to complete an example set of tasks and measure a lot of things about it, how successful they were, how many steps they took, whether they committed any errors, encountered frustrations, time how long it took for them to finish. Um, I tend to do this by recruiting online and I use Usabilla and Ethneo. Those are like passive recruitment tools. They get people in the door, we do screen share. Um, I try and recruit people in Chicago where I live and have them come by my office if I need to. Um, and just like comp them with an Amazon gift card or something like that. Uh, once I have insights from usability testing and I figured out all the ways in which my design is horrible, refine it further. Uh, take all those insights and improve the design. If there are people tripping themselves up on one part and it's pretty consistent, find a way to rework it so it's clearer. Uh, there are a million resources for usability testing out there. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail because that could be a whole separate talk. The classic is called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. Uh, there's a book called Remote Research by Nate Bolt that's really good. Uh, undercover User Experience Design is another. I go into like other resources and stuff towards the end of this talk. 
uh, and then you launch and iterate. Um, I, in a perfect project, I'm never done after launch. I am running analytics out the wazoo on this application to make sure that everybody's clicking in the right way, they're not punting off, and trying to figure out other ways to improve it. Um, and assessing that as much as I possibly can. Uh, I don't think that design is ever done, and I think that's increasingly a common mindset among everybody. Um, so overall, I think kind of a fresh perspective will help a lot in a web application, but it only works if you can do it sensitively and carefully. Uh, my own design projects take a long time because I throw away a lot of concepts along the way. I conduct a very lengthy research period. I have a lot of time for critique, for generating more ideas, for making sure we've settled on the right thing. And then once we've done that, trying to improve it further by running it past people. Um, and I, I deliberately made this talk about just shy of an hour long. Um, and I imagine I'll, we can have a really good Q&A process around here uh, right now. But hopefully this got you thinking about a lot of things to do in your own design process and rework whatever products you may be encountering. Um, here's a ton of resources. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me in tonight. Really appreciate it.